uh, over on this side of the room, please visit them. Uh, and if you're moved to uh, purchase something, please do so uh, as you leave tonight. We also, on every one of the seats tonight, there you have a flyer with uh, our upcoming programs. You know, this is our 14th year, and we believe we have the strongest lineup yet of our programs and in the 14 years uh, of our existence. We're so grateful for your support, uh, and we're able to do this uh, and continue to bring you the quality programs because of your support. So thank you for that. Uh, just a, a, a couple of uh, upcoming programs I want to call your attention to. Uh, Arab Fest. This is our fourth, uh, fourth annual, fourth annual Arab Fest. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, June second and third. If you know of a place that you could put a poster, there are many posters back on the back of the table there. Please grab one and post them uh, in your neighborhoods, in your churches, in your coffee shops, wherever you might be. It's going to be bigger and better than ever. We've averaged more than 2,500 people the last three years over the weekend at Airfest, and it's promising to be uh, better than ever this year. Uh, Family-friendly, free, uh, uh, free admittance, camel rides, activities for children, uh, wonderful entertainment. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful weekend. The night before Airfest begins, Friday, June the 1st, in the sanctuary here, uh, return engagement from uh, our friend Ali Paris from the West Coast. We're bringing Ali in from the Bay Area. He's a canoeist. It's uh, what we call a lap harp, a 72-string lap harp. Uh, he's uh, uh, world-renowned. He's played with Quincy Jones and Alicia Keys and Bobby McFerrin. And what's exciting about it is uh, uh, the program has been sponsored in part or funded in part with a grant from Arch United here in Fort Wayne. So every dollar, the, the tickets are $15 in advance, $20 at the door, but $15 in advance, $5 for students, 12 and under, free. What's exciting for us is that every dollar that's raised goes to support children's programming uh, in Bethlehem and in Annapolis. Uh, we have three uh, children's camps in Bethlehem, uh, arts camps and peace camps, and in Annapolis, uh, we help support a kindergarten in the old city, as well as a family a health clinic uh, for people uh, in the old city of Naples who make under $2,000 a year, the poorest of the poor Naples. And my uh, my solidarity group, uh, our tour, and we'll be taking the money with us uh, to, do, to give to these folks uh, in September when we go. So I really encourage you uh, to uh, attend. You'll have a wonderful evening of music here in the sanctuary on Friday evening, uh, June the 1st, and the money will go to a wonderful cause. As you listen to Father Naeem and Tarek tonight, uh, if you're moved by what you hear about the ministries of Seville Jerusalem and Friends of Seville North America, <coughs> Every dollar that's contributed will go toward the ministries of Friends of Seville, North America. And if you want to write a check, just make your check out to FOSNA, F-O-S-N-A, Friends of Seville, North America. And we would, be, we would be really delighted to receive your contribution. And finally, we have copies of uh, Father Naeem's new book, A Palestinian Theology of Liberation, The Bible, Justice, and the Israel-Palestine Conflict. For sale, the cost is twenty dollars. We'll take a cash, our credit card, or a check made payable to Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, Father Nine gets the uh, royalties uh, for his book. There are tickets available. By the way, I forgot that, Joe. Thank you for the the look that you gave me. <laughs> If you want to buy tickets for the Ali Paris concert tonight for $15, there are the blue copies that you see uh, 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 Joan Coslow back at our table. She'd be more, be more than happy to uh, uh, hook you up with, with a ticket or 10. So uh, thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. We're going to start now with uh, the program. I'm going to, I'm going to interview uh, Naeem and uh, Tarek for a little bit, and then we'll have some time for questions from the audience.
both. Uh, really, it is a blessing. Uh, Naeem, I told you I've been wanting to have you come here for the last six years, and so uh, thanks for finally accepting the invitation. Uh, We've been traveling for 12 days together. Uh, Naeem uh, uh, traveled for two weeks from uh, Vancouver to Halifax in Canada. Flew home for three days to Texas to rest, and now he was on a 12-day tour with us. This is the fifth city we've been to, so uh, you're home not real well. <laughs> Better than myself. Okay, uh, would, would you please, uh, uh, each one of you, take a minute to share your stories with us, and I am especially uh, 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 coming with the founding of Seville. Tell a little bit about Besan and just your journey up to the founding of Seville. I think I need to stand. I think I need to stand because uh, I like to see people. I like people to see me. So, okay. Um, I was born in a small town south of the Sea of Galilee called Bisat. In the New Testament, uh, it was uh, called Scythopolis. It was part of the Decapolis cities, the ten cities that we read about in the New Testament. So Bissan was a beautiful place. My father uh, was a goldsmith, silversmith, uh, what people would call here jeweler. And he had a wonderful business because all around Bissan, we had over 20 uh, the villages and towns that were Palestinian, and all of them came to Bissan to do their shopping. Uh, and so I have very fond memories. I was 11 years old at the time. So uh, our life was disrupted when the Zionist Jews came to be sent and occupied us. We did not have any army to defend us. It was just they took us over. And a few days later, they gave us an order to get out of town within two hours. And they said, if you don't leave, we will kill you. My father pleaded with the military governor and told the military governor, I have nowhere to go. I have 10 children. The, the oldest two are married, they have children. Um, let us just stay in our homes. And it was very clear. He said to them, if you don't leave, we will kill you. We had no choice. We were asked to meet at the center of town in Bissan. Uh, if, you, if you come to visit us, I can take you there and show you the center of town is still there. But we were driven out. They do what they did. They divided us into two groups, Muslims on one side, Christians on another. They took all the Muslims down the Jordan River, very close to Bissan, and they told the, the Muslims to go to the kingdom of Jordan. And they took us Christians and left us on the outskirts of the town Nazareth. I, uh, and that's where I was, I, I went to primary school in Nazareth, and uh, that was the end of our life in Bissan. Uh, now, what happened to my family happened to thousands of Palestinian families. Most Americans don't know this side of the story. They're familiar with the Jewish narrative about what happened to Jews, especially because of the Holocaust. <laughs> Uh, but most people did not hear what happened to the Palestinians. So we really paid the price, you know, for, um, uh, I know we feel uh, the, the agony of the Jews during the Holocaust, but we also paid the price because we lost our this Palestine. We lost our home, the villages. And then, and so, many Palestinians were either driven out at gunpoint, like what happened to us, or where, or they fled. And in order for the state of Israel to prevent the Palestinian refugees from returning to their homes and villages, they bulldozed around 500 villages and towns throughout Palestine. So if, if some of the refugees managed to get back, there was nothing to come back because they were all devastated and demolished. That's 
this is our the story of Palestine that you many of you have not heard, you know, and I think it's very important to know this. So anyway, that's part of uh, my story. But Mike also asked me to say something about the beginning of Sabir. So many years later, you know, after my studies and my ordination in the Episcopal Church back home and serving a number of churches in Galilee, I was invited, well, not invited, I was asked by the bishop to come to go to Jerusalem. I really did not want to go to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a very difficult place. And I knew that uh, 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 it's, it's going to be tough to go to Jerusalem politically. It's always tense. Religiously, it's always tense. And I knew that my Lord and Savior, what happened to him in Jerusalem. <laughs> so I, was, I knew that there is dangerous to go to Jerusalem. Anyway, I went to the cathedral in Jerusalem where I started my ministry there with the Palestinian congregation. But soon after that, um, the Intifada, that is the uprising of the Palestinian people in 1987, started. And it revolutionized my ministry at the cathedral. And that's where Palestinian liberation theology came into being with my people who were reflecting on what it means to live their Christian faith under the occupation and oppressive occupation of the government of Israel. And, but that's where our people, Palestinians, discovered that Jesus, whom we call Savior and Lord, he lived all his life under occupation. So they began to see Jesus as their liberator, as their paradigm of faith, you know, and they, and they saw Jesus as a Palestinian living under occupation. And that finally, he was killed by the occupation forces and in collusion with the religious leaders of the day. And, and that's where Palestinian liberation theology uh, came into being. And providentially, it was around the same time that my first book was going to be published, uh, Justice and Only Justice, a Palestinian theology of liberation. So between the experience of our people in reflecting theologically on what it means to be faithful Christians, uh, standing for justice, being resilient under uh, the occupation of the government of Israel, and between the book that came out, actually was published in 1989, uh, I think Palestinian Liberation Theology came into being, and a few years later, uh, Sabil came into being. Sabil was the center that was translating Palestinian Liberation Theology into activities and programs. And Sabil is an Arabic word that has two meanings. It means the way, the path, and it also means a spring of water. And if you know your New Testament well, you will know that according to the book of Acts, the first followers of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem were known as the people of the way. So it is our earliest name given to the followers of Christ. Long before, not long, but sometime before the people, the followers of Christ were known as Christians. So the earliest name was the people of the way, because they believed that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. So this is, again, just an introduction to both my own story and the emergence of Sabir and Palestinian liberation. Thank you all. Can you hear me fine with this? Yes. Yeah. So I heard there was a speaking tour last year that came to Fort Wayne, and um, it was to include Ahad Tamimi, a Palestinian, and Amanda Weatherspoon. Unfortunately, it ended up including, um, it did not end up including Ahad Tamimi because she could not uh, get a visa to, get, move, uh, to uh, leave Palestine. So it had Nadia Tannouz, 
and Amanda Weatherspoon. Who attended that? It was at the Unitarian congregation. A few of you guys. Good. They told me that Mike Scott and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace put on the most kick-ass events in town. <laughs> and I can see that they were very right. The part where Ahd could not get out, Ahd was, is a young Palestinian woman, right now is, uh, I believe it's 16 years old, she's 16 years old, 17 at this point. 17. She is sitting in Israeli jail. Why? Nine-month sentence in Israeli jail for daring to slap a soldier that has been occupying her land and growing up her whole life under occupation, resisting her family, resisting every single week, marching against Israel's occupation. So a young woman dares to slap a soldier, she gets nine months after that soldier just shot and killed a family member of hers. In the news simultaneously, we hear of an Israeli soldier that killed the Palestinian man as he was dying, suffering on the ground. The soldier came up and shot him. The soldier gets eight months sentence. Where's the equality in that? I'm thankful for this space because it is very few that choose to center Palestinian voices in the U.S. and this is one of them because these are the prophetic voices and when I speak I don't just speak on my behalf I speak in continuation with those who I stand on their shoulders like Reverend Naim and those that have been active in the movement like Ahad and that's why I am thankful to be here representing my family and all those folks that I am in coalition with. In regards you asked us to tell our lives in a minute <laughs> so I'll be brief, obviously. When Reverend Knight speaks about his life in Visan, 40 years after that, I was an 11-year-old kid. In late eight, 1980s, I was 11 years old, running the streets of Bethlehem. My uh, father at the time, he's actually a carpenter, but he had a grocery store with my uncles. And it was right centered between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. The memories of an 11 year old is uh, it, <coughs> walking around that grocery store, chewing on gum, eating all the candies I could, and watching as all the Israeli Jews came into town to visit Rachel's tomb, which is right, was right next to the shop. Also, Palestinians seeking medical, social services going from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And so it was an intermixing, intercultural, multicultural intermixing that it was beautiful. My father spoke Hebrew because of that intermixing. And some Jews spoke a bit of Arabic. That was to end. Why? Because when there was an uprising against the occupation from the Palestinian side, the Intifada, in the late 1980s, and the people said, no more will we tolerate Israel's foot on our neck. That road was closed that we ran on in children and that my uncle took us on a motorcycle ride. That road became a part of an apartheid system that Israel's regime continued. What do I mean? I remember my father taking us to Jerusalem where we had a different license plate color. My father had to stand and, and be uh, motioned to the side of the road because we were driving the wrong type of car, Palestinian car. My mother, I remember the fear on her face as this, the guns were pointed on her heads. And that's to go from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, which is occupied East Jerusalem. We were not going anywhere near Israel. But anyways, we would be stopped as every other Palestinian family. That road became a symbol for me growing up of the, the oppression because my family thereafter moved to Houston, Texas. We had an uncle there. And I returned, I was 12 when we left, I returned when I was 24 for the very first time. I saw the confiscation of our lands that continued. I saw the soldiers that have fortified that checkpoint. It was similar to an airport checkpoint, it became a much more fortified checkpoint. 
when I came back, and I kept coming back for the next 17 years to my hometown, Bethlehem, that slowly became, and I worked in the area when I was 24, when I went back, I worked, first of all, um, I graduated from law school and worked on negotiations uh, departments called, uh, it, was, it was part of the PLO negotiations. And at that time, it was still continuing to be a checkpoint. But over time, as I was working there for the next 15 years, that became the 30-foot concrete wall with watchtowers. The entry for most folks who have been to Palestine, Israel, that is what you'll go through. You probably crossed through my family's um, uh, front yards. So this is a sad reality of now, the area, though, that generation that grew after me, grew up after me, has never met an Israeli Jew other than a settler or a soldier. So if Israel thinks that with cutting off people from each other, we can have peace, that is that will never happen. That will never happen. How could we, when we don't see our neighbor, love them? How could we love our God and love our neighbor if we don't even see our neighbor? So Israel is on a path of destruction. We can talk about this a bit more, but I just want to wrap it up for this question, Mike, so you can continue the interview. Uh, Say another word, Tarek. Uh, um, say, say a quick word. Uh, um, you, I mean, I've heard you speak now a number of times. You don't call this a conflict. You don't even like to talk about this as an occupation. What are the kind of words that you use to call what's happening there? We don't call Palestine Israel conflict here anymore. So say a word about it. Sure. Um, so when we call it a conflict, I studied conflict resolution under Bernard Lafayette, who was a protege of Martin Luther King. Thank you. Under Martin Luther King. And he talks about conflict and how you de-escalate or can escalate conflict. I've gone through the many levels of conflict, uh, the pervasive, the overt, the, the, and, and how to de-escalate that. Why I don't consider it a conflict and why I stopped with the negotiations department in Palestine is because that man, that oppression regime, oppressive regime, apartheid regime, has its foot on our necks. It has its foot on our necks. And as such, it is not a conflict. We need that foot to be removed for us to get up, for us to sit on the same table. And then maybe Mike and I sitting at the same table could have a conflict. A woman, a, a, a um, husband and wife would have a conflict at home if it's an equal marriage, right? So what I consider it is an oppressive apartheid regime. And in working with the negotiations, it became sold to the world as a conflict because we wanted to have two states, the Palestinians live here and the Israelis live here. It was never a conflict. And because I realized I was negotiating or doing research that negotiated my people's rights away and humanity, <laughs> and I will never do that. And so for the next 15 years, I dedicated my life to working on nonviolence initiatives, including uh, trainings for college students, including standing at the checkpoint and monitoring, including uh, covering home demolitions and all these things that were not covered in the news. Naeem, uh, one of the hallmarks of the Palestinian Jewish community Christian Zionism and that theology 
uh, and why why it's not just something on the margins that we shouldn't have to worry about, but why it's so dangerous. Christian Zionism preceded Jewish political Zionism at least 80 years. So before there were um, Jewish Zionists officially, we had Christians who, due to their reading of the Bible, surmised that Jews must return to Palestine in order to usher the second coming of Christ. It's a long story, but it is a fascinating story. When you think about those big guys who were Christian Zionists, it started in the early 19th century with a person by the name of John Nelson Darby, you know, from Britain. And this he was the founder of what became known as um, dispensationalism. I don't know how many of you were brought up on dispensationalism, but maybe in the 19th 60s, 50s, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, when I came into this country, I came across many Christians in the South who were brought up on the Schofield Reference Bible, which was, which, which took the theology and the interpretation of John Nelson Darby and and it was published as a Bible that many Christians were brought, brought up on. Very uh, Christian Zionists. Those early Christians were not known as Christian Zionists. They were known in the beginning as res Restorationists because they were promoting and working for the return of Jews to Palestine so that they can speed up uh, the, the second coming of Christ. And it's a long story again. But what is important is that in the 1840s, Lord Shaftesbury in England was lobbying the British government to send British Jews to Palestine. And in the United States, William Blackstone was lobbying President Harrison to send American Jews to Palestine because they were they wanted to hasten the, the, the end of the world, the second coming of Christ. And if, if I may say, these many of these Christian Zionists were really anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, because their theology told them that before the second of coming of Christ can take place, there will be the Battle of Armageddon, and two-thirds of the Jews will be massacred, and the last third will become Christian. Now, Jews don't like that, <laughs> and rightly so. But it is bad theology, bad interpretation of the scriptures. But this is the theology that many American fundamentalist Christians were brought up on. And and for many years, the, the Christian Zionists did not work with the Jewish Zionists because of what I've just told you, that the Jews did not like their theology, you know. But nowadays, many Jews, including the government of Israel, say, we don't care about that kind of a theology, we don't believe in it, but so long as these Christians support Israel financially, politically, militarily, we don't mind. They can support us. And this theology of theirs is, as far as we're concerned, baloney. You know, it's unacceptable. Now, John Hagee today is a, is a Christian and probably the most prominent Christian Zionist whom Israel loves. 
So when President Trump was going to be moving the embassy uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, John Hagee was invited. I don't know who invited him, whether it was Trump or the Israeli government, because they like him very much. So he was there, and then they invited the, the, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, this Jeffers, um, also to be there, who is actually a very Christian, uh, not only a Christian Zionist, but he is, um, but he is a militant person, a, a Christian, Christian, what do we call it, Christian, uh, yeah, uh, uh, a, a, a Christian anti-Semitic, you know, because of his theology. But they invited him, and you can see immediately behind uh, what they what they what they believe and the way they are trying to really reach out to the to the Christians in this country. And I hope, I hope you can, if you, this is only a few words about it, and please uh, Google Christian Zionism. You will find so much more. I have written quite a bit about it myself. You know, but I don't think we have those books. You know, but uh, I, we only have my latest book, and I will I mention them, but I don't go into details. But this is very dangerous, my friends, because of the way they interpret the scripture, and they don't mind if the Palestinians are killed because they think that God wants us to be driven out of the land, so that the Jewish people will take over the whole of the land, and so that can speed up the second coming of Christ. So it's a very dangerous type of theology that uh, these people spout. There's a, a wonderful website, uh, christianzionism.org, christianzionism.org, that refutes a number of the myths of Christian Zionism that you may want to check out. Tark, uh, one of the things that I really love about uh, Friends of Seville North America is that it, I call it a, a catalyst and convener of coalitions. Uh, say a word about uh, how Plasma is doing that ecumenically with the various Palestine Israel networks of the denominations, but also how we're doing that interfaith with the Jewish and Muslim groups and also intersectionally with other uh, uh, liberation groups. So those three, uh, uh, ecumenically, interfaith, and intersectionally. Could you do one? Might better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as an ecumenical uh, movement, we've been having our leadership retreats every other year. This year, we have uh, what we call a conference to expand that leadership retreat because before it was centered around those organizers in the country. Um, we have in St. Paul, September 27th and 28th, our prophetic action conference. Uh, if you are, it is, it is by invitation. If you are interested, you can uh, send an email uh, to us on the general email in the, uh, in the what color, orange brochure. Um, and, and, and we will look at sending you an invitation. In that space, what do we want to do? We are bringing together the Palestine-Israel networks in the various churches. We are talking about the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the UCC Church, the Mennonite Church, all Lutheran Church, there are a number of them, Unitarian Church. And we want that space to talk about a few things. One is to look at Berber Naim's books and liberation theology and contextualize it in regards to Palestinian liberation from these biblical passages. That's one. Two is how do we do the work, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, intersectionally with the black movement, with the immigrant movement, with the Latino movement. That is a second space and a panel we would have. Tracy Blackman has already been invited. She's um, a black pastor, also justice, uh, minister of justice in the UCC church, will be our keynote. Uh, Reverend Naim hopefully will be there. Um, and also in regards to interfaith, 
well, we do the work interfaith. We are not interfaith ourselves internally. We do the ecumenical because we're a Christian voice for Palestine. But we're also on any kind of uh, statement we put out um, in support of justice. We do have, we work with American Muslims for Palestine. We work with Jewish Voice for Peace. And we do look at uh, other um, persons of faith to support our work. The couple of things we do uh, internally, uh, a lot of you have probably known about the denominational divestments, the boycott, divestment sanctions, and the, the divestments that have been done with a lot of these churches we just named. Uh, a lot of them already they have voted to divest from some key companies that have been violating Palestinian human rights. The ones that are named usually HP for Hewlett Packard, Motorola and Caterpillar, the first two companies because they provide security for Israel and at the checkpoints they are the ones that uh, suppress Palestinian rights. And there are many multiple companies. But so at that level and with the Palestine Israel networks, we support the church to be the prophetic space in support of Palestinian justice. And we try to center Palestinian voices through our work with Sabil and internally as Father. In addition, at this point, these divestment campaigns are moving to municipal local level. Why should our churches be the only players on Palestinian justice when also our local municipal governments are investing in these same companies? These same companies where HP does the security against Palestinians and also does the security against black prisoners in this country and also for uh, against immigrants the rights so when we talk about intersectional work it is not just sitting down in a room and talking it is looking at which are the uh, common denominator companies that have human rights abuses that need to be signaled out in these uh, in these local governments and as such we ask these local governments to pass socially responsible investments please these are criteria on what we will support as a people these are our tax dollars. These are our local government representatives. We should have a say on where our money goes. And as such, we provide support uh, for these persons, for the municipality, to pass criteria that will factor out those with human rights abuses. We don't invest in gambling. We don't invest in tobacco, right? So why should we invest in any human rights uh, companies that, that, uh, that, that suppress and oppress the people? So in those spaces, we also work on intersectionality. We also do uh, partner and we try to get the speakers from these various movements to be at our conferences and to speak about this intersectionality. And so for me, it is moving out of, because also intersectionality can become a buzzword at times too. It's like, okay, now it's the sexy thing at church to do. Let's make sure we have a black person on a panel. Let's make sure we have a Palestinian on a panel. It's not enough to have a black person speak at a panel. And then the black persons usually ask the questions, they answer all these questions, and then we say, could you tell us what to do? Well, the thing is, for a lot of white folks in this country, the thing to do is to first work on your internal racism yourself and do the work internally and not always go to those persons of color <laughs> and ask them, how could I be less racist? A lot of persons of color are tired of those questions and they want you to move forward on it. They want you to move forward and do that work internally. So for a lot of the churches, there are amazing curricula on anti-oppressive, uh, anti anti-racism training. And likewise for women. Women, I'm sure, are tired of telling us men what we're supposed to do and not do. And, and, and it, that, that we need to do the work ourselves on anti-sexism within ourselves as men. And so that work is always, I try to center it, and is part and parcel of doing peace work. Because just as the movement talks about not doing peace work out there without doing it in your backyard, well, the backyard in this instance is our own hearts, our own hearts that have grown up in a sexist, racist society, and to deconstruct that for ourselves as simultaneously we build larger coalitions into a national and a global movement. So that all has to happen simultaneously. If it's too much for us, if it's too much for us, then we're not ready to take up Christ's message. That's what I'd say. Preach, brother. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you spend a 
number of years trying to spell out your own theology of the land. And in uh, this latest book, you talk about the uh, apex, the uh, culmination of Old Testament theology. And you don't have to wait to get to the New Testament to find an inclusive theology. You said that uh, you have found it uh, in the prophets, but particularly in the book of John. Talk a little bit about your theology of the land and also uh, how that's how that uh, uh, is manifested in the book of John. You know the story of the of Jonah. God tells Jonah the prophet to go to Assyria, to go to Nineveh, and to preach repentance. To the Assyrians. Assyrians, in today's language, would be the Iraqis in Iraq. Well, Jonah decided that he doesn't want to go to Iraq and speak uh, repentance uh, to, the, uh, to the Iraqis because the Assyrians, the Iraqis, had actually destroyed uh, the kingdom of Israel, ancient kingdom of Israel. So he was upset with his God because God is asking him to go to his enemy and preach uh, repentance. So he thought that the best way to do is to get on a boat and go to the other direction. So he, instead of going to Iraq, he tried to go to uh, Spain, Karshish, although in the opposite direction. <laughs> and then you have the story unfolding where the storm comes in and and finally um, Jonah tells him look you got it's all my fault it's my God who I am fleeing from him so they threw Jonah into the sea and immediately the car sea what became calm and Jonah found you know was swallowed by a big fish and for three days he was there praying to God, and then God told the people, uh, told the fish to throw out Jonah on the shore, and that happened. And then God tells Jonah, "Go to Syria, Assyria. You gotta go there. That's where you need to go and preach repentance." And so reluctantly, Jonah goes to Iraq, to Nineveh, the capital of. Assyria. And he, for 40 days, he goes around preaching repentance to these people. He did not like it, but he did it. And then, to his horror, he found out that the people of Assyria and Nineveh, they repented. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. He did not want them to repent. He wanted God to just destroy the city because. He is, his preaching was, if you don't repent, in 40 days, God is going to destroy the city. So he became so upset when he found out that God changed his mind. And so he went out, and I don't know if any of you know Iraq. In the summer, the, the, the heat is unbearable, more than Texas. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so he was outside there and waiting to see what God is going to do. And the story ends when God tells Jonah, he says, look, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you that when he was there, God made a, what do you call it, a plan to come and make a shade for Jonah from the heat of the sun. So he was happy to see this plant corn, some, some form of corn, came up and made a shade for him. And then the following day, this gourd, this fat, dried up. And so Jonah was so upset and said, oh God, I want to die. Why did you do this to me? And God looked at Jonah and he said, look, you were upset because of this plant that grew up in one day 
you did not have anything to do with it. And then you were upset. You wanted to die because it's the right up. Should I not be in should I not be concerned about thousands and thousands of people here in Nineveh who are human beings and not only human beings, but even the animals and so on? Should I not be concerned about it? And, uh, and the story ends abruptly in that way. So I always read this story, like I'm sure many of you. You know, it's in the Bible, it's part of the minor prophets. It's very hard to find it because it's a very short little book. So you have to look for it. But then it's a wonderful story because it's the only story in the minor prophets. So when I was reading my Bible and I did not like what to read, as a boy, little boy, I wanted a story. So it was Jonah. Now, what is the meaning of this story? I, I reflected on this story many times. But finally, I was able to discover, by the grace of God, a deeper meaning than just a simple story that somebody has created. I don't think we're talking about reality. It's a story. It's a story. It's a beautiful story. So, when you begin to reflect on the story, it is first of all saying something about God. That God is not the God of only one people. God is the God of all people, the creator, the God of, uh, of uh, mercy, the, the God of love, the God who cares about all people. This is this is very important part of the story. So if you want to know about the God, about God, this the writer is saying, pay attention to the nature of the God. The God who is asking Jonah to go thousands of miles, thousands of kilometers actually, to go to Iraq. The second thing about the story of Jonah is that it talks or challenges Jonah's understanding of the people of God. Because for Jonah, the people of God were only the Israelites, the people of Israel. And all of a sudden, God is concerned about all our people. So God's people go beyond, beyond the Israelite community. So it's a wonderful theology. Thirdly, Jonah was concerned. He, he, he believed that God is a tribal God. God is only concerned about uh, the land of Israel in his <coughs> thinking. But God is now is concerned about the land of Assyria, Iran. So his theology of land was also stretched in a way that he could not believe it. So basically, the, the, the story of Jonah, uh, uh, this wonderful writer, is trying to critique what was happening in his day. And please remember that the book of Jonah was probably one of the last books to be written before the end of the Old Testament. I'm talking about maybe 200 to 300 BC before Christ. You know, so, and here it is, you know, the people were very arrogant, you know, they thought that they're the only people of God, that God is, will protect them within their own, within their own land, and God is the God of Israel, and that's it. And so the writer of Jonah, whoever he was, or she was, we don't know, you know, was critiquing the theology of God of the people, the, the exclusive theology of God, the exclusive theology of the people of God, the exclusive theology of land. These three. And he and he is talking now about a theology that is very inclusive about God. Before you get to the New Testament, it's amazing when God so loved the world. So the theology of, land, of, of Jonah for me is amazing. And if you want to get the book, if for nothing else, to read about the, the theology of Jonah. Uh, and this comes from the Old Testament. It, and, but Jesus 
refers to Jonah more than once in the New Testament. I, uh, thank you. I, I just have a couple more questions for each of you, and then we're going to open up for questions from uh, uh, the gathered folks here. We can't have you here in Fort Wayne at this terrible, uh, momentous time without asking you both to comment on God. And so I'd like for each one of you to maybe just say a word about uh, uh, what's been happening in Gaza over the last number of weeks, and particularly the last uh, couple of weeks, and just uh, to share with us uh, your thoughts, but also uh, how it's impacted your heart. So, please. So it's, it was 62 Palestinians who were killed by over 100 snipers from hills right next to them, if you saw the pictures. And the world, nor our churches, were in an outrage over what's happening, albeit up to $5 billion of our tax dollars go there to support these troops that were shooting at 62 Palestinians or shot down 62 Palestinians and injured up to 3,000 people. It's an outrage. And it has not been covered enough in the media, and are definitely our government has not much, done much about it. For me, what I feel and what I think, when I look at these images, I get the, the, the stream of consciousness of questions from the different folks I've talked to, uh, to over the 20, last 20 years. What are, what, what are Palestinians doing on the ground that is nonviolent? Where are your nonviolent leaders? If thousands of people are marching for freedom, these are our nonviolent people. The leaders who continue to be shot and jailed by Israel are these nonviolent Martin Luther King, Ben Gandhi, and whoever else you want to put in there. So our people have been practicing nonviolence for decades getting up in the morning and going through two, three checkpoints for some of the workers or women or first grade, uh, first graders, that is nonviolence on a daily basis. So then to be uh, shot 62 people for practicing nonviolence without an outrage is just frankly depressing, to say it uh, mildly. And I think it is just part of our larger human suffering and not speaking up, including in our churches. We say we might not have spoken up during the Holocaust or during pogroms. We also, in our mainline denominations, are not speaking up here in regards to the Palestinian justice. And I ask you in each one of your churches that this is the time to speak up. We cannot anymore be silent. Remember, Martin Luther King said, it is the appalling silence of the majority that allows this violence to go on. And that's what's happening in our churches on a denominational and local level. And as such, let me just mention another program here, which is just at a local level to ask you to practice something, HB Free Churches. We have 30 churches so far as part of Fogna that have said we are HB Free Church. What does that mean? We will no longer buy HP equipment. If we have it, we're not going to get rid of it because that's environmental waste, but we will buy generic cartridges. That is a small, small, small commitment that a church can do, but it is like voting. But by the time we get 50 churches at the end of this year and then following, we are making a large statement in our local churches to these companies. The same statement that these denominations, our own denominations here, have made to the companies. We need to educate and make these statements on the ground in our local churches. Uh, because I am tired and sick of seeing my own people get killed like that. I, 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 I don't know what else to say. Let me just give you a little background about Gaza. Gaza is a, is a obviously Palestinian city in the south of the Palestine. And uh, it always had a, um, a indigenous Gazan, Palestinian Gazan population there. And 
uh, in the early Christian centuries, we had a number of uh, saints that came out from Gaza. So it has also, it's connected uh, historically with the Christian church from the very beginning. And those of you who know your, your scriptures, remember that in the book of Acts, there is the story of the eunuch, you know, who met Philip on the way to Gaza. You know, it's, it's there. So Gaza is also mentioned in the book of Acts in our New Testament. So, um, so Gaza uh, population swelled in 1948 when all the people from Tel Aviv and south, the villages and towns in that area, many of them uh, were driven out and they came to Gaza. So Gaza immediately became, became a, a, a big uh, place for Palestinian refugees. To, today, there are between one and a half to two million Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip. Uh, uh, so uh, we have mo mainly Muslim, Muslim people. But we also have, historically, we've had three churches in Gaza. Today, there are only practically two churches. The indigenous church of the land in Palestine is the Orthodox Byzantine Church. All of us, at one point in our history, belong to this church. My father started as a Orthodox Christian in Palestine. Uh, I have relatives in Gaza. You know, my mother's family came from Gaza, and they were Orthodox Christian. There is also a Roman Catholic Church in Gaza, you know, but the Orthodox Church is the largest. There was a time in which we have a small Anglican Church, Episcopal Church in this country, Anglican Church in Gaza. We still have the hospital, an Anglican hospital in Gaza called Arab Ahli. Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza. And we still, the church serves the refugees in Gaza. So, so Gaza um, was a very important place, you know, and the ministry has continued, continued there. Um, now, Israel doesn't want the Palestinians to have their state on the West Bank and Gaza, and they've been trying to, uh, to, to make it difficult for the creation of a Palestinian state. But late, lately, we started hearing that uh, America and Israel, they really want to make a Palestinian state in Gaza, not on the West Bank. So Israel wants to take all the West Bank and somehow drive the people out or give them home rule and control them, control them. But they've been promoting the idea that maybe the Gaza Strip will be the Palestine, the state of Palestine, which we reject because we want, we want the state of Palestine to be on the West Bank and Gaza Strip, including East Jerusalem. This is what we want, because this is international law. This is United Nations resolution. Israel doesn't pay attention, doesn't respect international law. You need to remember this. All the occupation of, the, of Palestine, Palestinian territories, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip are illegal under international law. The problem today, my friend, is that the United States doesn't respect international law. It wants other people to respect it, but not Israel and not the United States. And so you have a great problem here in this country. And you need to stand up that the United States need to respect United Nations resolutions, need to respect international law. Because if we implement international law, 
we have no problem. Palestinians want the implementation of international law. That's it. That's it. Which means that the creation of a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. Israel doesn't want this, and we need your voices. You need to stand up for justice in accordance with international law. This is our message to you, my brothers and sisters. Sorry, I'd like you to follow up. Uh, you have an extra word to say, but I'd also like you to talk about uh, advocacy campaigns in local communities and say a word about the, the, what just happened in Durham, particularly, and the uh, exchange between uh, U.S. police and uh, Israeli uh, military training, and then follow up with, with what uh, you were going to say. Yeah, um, what I was going to follow up on is we always heard winners write history, right? That's one. That's only if we allow them. But then the second thing is also how we contextualize our language that we're using here is very important because oppressors also dictate the language we use. What do I mean in this context? When we talk about Gaza, even here on this table, we're referring to it as a separate geography and population from Palestine. And that is part of the language that, that we have been mentally occupied with. So it is not Gaza, it is Palestine. Palestinians are marching. It is Palestinians in the West Bank. It is Palestinians that are 20% of the current state of Israel. It is Palestinians who are 6 million refugees. It is Palestinians who are 12 million around the world. We are one identity, and to fall into the Cantonization of our identity is just feeding into that narrative that's being dictated to us from outside. So I want to re-dictate it and redefine it as we continue on this table, that conversation, and with you all. In regards to Durham, and that was one of the things um, um, I meant to mention as part of the intersectional um, advocacy campaigns. We just came from Durham and met some of the folks who worked on this amazing campaign. The campaign was, uh, well, in looking at Ferguson, in looking at Ferguson, two out of the four police departments were trained that were active in Ferguson by Israeli police. And as such, what's happening on our U.S. streets is the militarization of our police forces. And that is being done by Israel and the Israeli government. We need to stop that militarization. It is coming on our streets. So when we talk about uh, why it's important to do intersectional work, we also talk, should talk about the importance of multi-justice work. Because it is no longer something that happens just on your backyard. What's happening with a corporation on your backyard is the same thing happening across the world. This is part of our globalization system. And as such, the globalization, we can no longer afford in our churches to say, oh, do I work on Palestine or do I work on black rights in my backyard? It is the same thing. If you want to look at the common denominators, fine. We can look at these common denominators. But they are getting multiple common denominators intersections at this point. And hence, the momentum, the necessity for building that momentum all across these different movements. So in Durham, the mayor signed on to the statement that said, we will no longer do business with Israel with our police forces. We will no longer exchange or have these uh, trainings by Israel's police forces. This is another program we should be carrying on our streets in every city in the U.S. Um, in regards to uh, Gaza, just a couple of things to add to what Reverend Naim was saying. It's been 10 years that Gaza has been an open air prison. It has been 10 years of 2 million people being encaged in prisons. Israel has been suffocating Gaza for all these years and now only allowing 500 people to leave on a daily basis out of 2 million. 500 people out of 2 million are allowed to leave on a daily basis. 50% did not have enough resources or still do not have enough resources as food and water or electricity. And up to 55% unemployment. So that's the context in which people are marching in the streets. Um, there was something else you asked me, that was enough. <laughs>
I just have one more question for each of you, and we're going to open it up. Uh, Naeem, uh, this uh, particularly because you're from Jerusalem, uh, and I want you to say a word about this. The strongest that you've been this entire trip that we've traveled together, uh, you've talked about the slow motion Judaization of Jerusalem and cultural genocide. Say a word about that, in particular with regard to the Haram Sharif, the Temple Mount, the Aqsa compound, uh, that whole complex of issues. Can you say a word about the Judaization of Jerusalem, please? Yeah, I mean, it's the most important issue regarding the, the whole conflict back home. It has to do with Jerusalem. What do you do with Jerusalem? And uh, I think it's very important, my friends, to pay attention to this. Because the blunder which President Trump has done, it, excuse me, I am not an American. Uh, so I, I have to tread very carefully on your sensitivities. But I tell you, uh, it's very sad that Trump was not sensitive enough to the significance of Jerusalem to the three monotheistic religions. Jerusalem is equally holy, equally holy to Muslims and to Christians. I mean, if I had time and you had time, I'll give you a lecture on the significance of Jerusalem to every one of the three religions. Uh, uh, so you cannot get one religion to have monopoly on Jerusalem. You can. If you are fair, history has moved. History did not stop. And so by the time we, we came to the 20th century, Jerusalem has become equally holy, equally significant, equally special to every one of the religions. And now, Israel managed to, in its, in its manipulation of Trump, in fact, a friend of ours told us that, that Israel has made of the United States a vassalage. <laughs> so Israel called the shots, and the United States just obeys what Israel is doing. I think you need to think about this because the problem or the question of Jerusalem has not been resolved as far as I'm concerned. Because it was only proclaimed by one person who happens to be the president of the strongest military country in the world. He did not consult with the United Nations with international law. Everything President Trump has done is against international law and against United Nations resolution. And this is unacceptable. So I say, forget it. Forget what they've done. Because it's not finished. The question of Jerusalem, we must continue to stand up against, against what Trump has done in Jerusalem. We must continue to lift up the, the justice in accordance with international law. Had, I tell you, had Trump, when he stood up and proclaimed about Jerusalem, had he said that West Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and East Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine, we would have cheered for him. We would have accepted this. The fact that he gave the whole of Jerusalem to Israel, by what right? What right? This is, this is crazy. So for those of us who know the history, cannot believe what happened. So my friends, nowadays it's becoming very dangerous. There are thousands of people because of what Trump has said, Palestinians, Thousands of people have been injured, wounded, or killed because not only the Muslims, but the Christians are also fighting. 
for their right in Jerusalem. And the question of sovereignty is very, very important. So in my book, I try to deal with this, although I wrote it a few weeks maybe before the, before the, what Trump has done. So please pay attention to the news. And I tell you one thing, uh, what scares me is that, mark my word, I pray to God that I am wrong. But knowing the Israeli mind and the Israeli injustice, I'm afraid that what Israel now will start doing will try to control the Haram area, which is the, the, the Dome of the Rock, the Aqsa Mosque, that belongs, belongs to the Muslims. And here as a Christian, I'm standing with my friends, the Muslim people, because that's their right for that place. And now the Christian Zionists and the Jewish Zionists and the American uh, administration and Israel is now thinking about how to take it over. It's very dangerous, very dangerous. And I think we as Christians need to stand for justice for the oppressed people of Jerusalem, the Christians and the Muslims, and especially the Haram area. So please, I mean, my what I've written is only very little short piece on Jerusalem, but there is so much that you can find on the internet. And please educate yourself on this and take a stand against what Israel is doing and what the American administration is doing. Thank you. One last question for you, Tara, and then we'll open it up. Uh, talk about how Francis in North America is mobilizing the next generation of activists and particularly empowering Palestinian voices. Yeah, with some of the programs I described, it is all part of building that momentum. A couple of additional things to add is um, teaching that liberation theology that Reverend Naeem has been preaching for decades and getting it in our own seminaries. So one is researching, we're researching 15 seminaries that put one, have, make sure to have his books in these seminary libraries, and two, to make it part of a curriculum and to tie it into coalition building with other liberation theologies. So it is lifted up in, in that space as we make that, a bit, uh, that part of the momentum building. Witness trips. We have been taking people for uh, 20 years at this point to go and visit Palestine. And we know that once you have seen, you cannot and see, and you come back and you are doing advocacy with, as, as, with our churches here back home or wherever your home is. The other is the Clergy and Seminary Action Council. For those who are clergy, I highlight this as an opportunity to stand up for justice, for justice for Palestinians and Israelis. We have 130 clergy who are ready to sign on to statements once we put it out uh, to say we are a moral voice for our country. It does make a difference. What I mentioned about the socially responsible investment screen in Portland that the city council passed, we had people telling us from the local government that they took, they, they, uh, they took uh, the needed attention to the fact that clergy were signing on to these statements. And we do this in coalition with the other organizations I mentioned. So there are rabbis and imams who are coming together as coalitions and signing on to this statement. For me, it is also being the prophetic voice, being the prophetic voice that Reverend Naim has been talking about for decades. And where are, because today, today, if you are not working on Palestinian rights today, I believe you would not have worked on black rights in 1960. Because it is the civil rights movement of our day, the Palestinian cause. And as such, we have to uh, belong in these spaces. And Fazlet wants to continue to be not just on the forefront, but also on the leftist edge of this. Because these are the spaces we should be as the, as the larger church. So I thank you. And also thank you. For, in regards to centering Palestinian voices, thank you. So, as I mentioned, part of it is taking these tours, myself and Reverend Nine here, Amanda Weatherspoon uh, in, in the intersectional movement, and uh, Ahad Tamimi, who we tried uh, last year, and uh, Nadia Talus came in her place, is part of our centering Palestinian voices in the movement. Because 
before the Palestinians were complacent about, I'm going to do the Reverend Ayn thing. Before Palestinians were complacent about others speaking on our behalf. No longer so. We have our voice, we have our story, we are claiming it, and we are in the forefront of telling it. And that's why I'm standing up. Because part of it is the narrative training. What is the narrative training? It is training our own Palestinian people on what is your story as somebody who never been to Palestine, these Palestinians growing up and not wanting to look Arab or sound like they have an Arabic last name or denying their identity at schools so they won't be harassed, they won't be attacked. How do we get them to claim their identity and belong to that larger movement and to claim their roots as part of a justice building movement? And we, in San Francisco, we did our first training. We thought maybe 10, 12 people would come. 33 young and old Palestinians showed up. Youngest was 18, oldest was 70. And they came to claim their story. Basically, we take steps on what happened to your family. How could you speak in front of a church? So we are continuing these trainings uh, in Houston and Denver as next location. So again, it is, and even working with the, the peace, Jewish, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and others, we are in constant communication about saying, we are no longer going to sit on the side. We are at the table and we will represent ourselves because that is part of the cycle, that is part of the wheels of justice in Palestine, where Palestinians have to continue to rise up and say, we will negotiate with you, but we will only negotiate with you when your foot is off our neck. When your foot is off our neck, then we will sit down at that table because we are never ready to negotiate our rights away. And as such, what's happening in the movement now is all about direct action. So when you talk about BDS, make sure when people criticize you and shame you for boycotting Israel or from divesting from Israeli resources, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed because you are part a parcel of taking direct action, which Martin Luther King took in this country. We're boycotting businesses, we're boycotting buses, we are taking rides on buses. So it is part of a direct action that will get us back to the negotiations table. It is the direct action that is removing that foot off of our neck. Then we are open to sitting down at the negotiating table. And that's the movement you belong to. So be proud of it and claim it in those states. <laughs> We have time for some questions. Rhonda, please. Are you states uh, say a little bit about um, what the results have been for those people who are trying to boycott or gas and sanction? And how is that federation of Israel and how the justice American citizens to lose our rights? Yeah. If you plan to the audience. <laughs> Uh, so, as many of you know, there are 24 states who have these anti-BDS laws on their books in different forms. Reverend Naim and I were in Atlanta, where, and, and Mike, uh, were in Atlanta, where we had a conference, and one of the speakers was Esther Kuntz. Who has heard the name Esther Kuntz? Yeah, okay, a few of you. So, this woman comes up to us and says, I'm a white lady from Kansas. I wanted to take a math course as a continuing education for myself. And then I get all these forms and I read them. And one of the forms that was sent later in a separate package was, I will not boycott Israel because I want to take a math course for my school as a school teacher. She's like, what in God's name is this? And so she talks about it with her pastor, with her husband, and they get the more of the story. And she says, I will not sign on to this. This is against my freedom of speech in this country. So when we talk about the, the international injustice issues reaching our own backyard, they are reaching our own constitutional rights too. And so Esther Kuntz decides to stand up and say, no, I will not sign. It goes to the courts. There's a law on the books in Kansas, as in 24 other states, that says you cannot boycott Israel if you want to receive federal funding for these programs. And if you don't sign on, you cannot go. The Kansas uh, Supreme Court decided to put it to put an injunction, meaning that it will not be enforced. And then the case, thankfully, is about to be dismissed against her as an individual. 
to say, this is unlawful. And so they are taking down that part of the, legis of the, of the laws on the books. Uh, that it is okay if you want to boycott Israel, you will not be punished and have these repercussions. But corporations are still being punished, even in Kansas and in many of these states that I said. Corporations that say, I will boycott and be part of a BDS movement. This is, this is in our own country, in our own backyards, where these rights are being infringed upon. In Arizona, there's, a, there's also a case that is going up or just starting, actually. Uh, likewise for a man with, with that kind of funding. Houston, Texas, I live there. We had the um, flooding, the flooding. You had to sign on a statement saying, I will not boycott Israel to get my federal funding for my home to rebuild. This is insane, the amount of oppression that is finding ourselves in our own backyard. It's also, in addition to 24 states, which includes Indiana, it's also, as you know, before the federal government, and uh, Senator Donnelly is one of the co-sponsors of the anti-BDS bill uh, as of May 2017. So uh, he's worthy of uh, a letter or 12 or 100 from you all to let him know how much we disagree with him. Another question, please. Chair? Uh, could you uh, explain, because of the Hamas, uh, has been uh, legitimized as a military um, organization, and and Israel is always saying, well, they they perpetrated the uh, injustice. We're just protecting our security, et cetera, et cetera. Hamas is a foil. Yeah. yeah. The way Israel has been justifying its killings of Palestinians in Gaza in the last several days uh, uh, by using the excuse that, or the, the statement that these Palestinians who are demonstrating are prompted by Hamas. So for Israel, and the United States, Hamas is a terrorist organization. So if you say that it is the Hamas are the ones behind the demonstration, then it's okay to kill the Palestinians. This is this is the way they're thinking. But all the news that are coming out, I mean the, the ones that I also can trust from our people and from international correspondents. They're saying that Hamas has nothing to do with these demonstrations. These are demonstrations carried out by Palestinians who are, as I told you a minute ago, that all these refugees, hundreds of thousands of them, who are living in Gaza since 1948, are sick and tired of living in these camps. And they want to go home in accordance with international law and in accordance with the United Nations resolution, which Israel is preventing, and the United States is backing Israel. So recently, the people of Gaza, it's the people of Gaza who said, enough is enough. We want to demonstrate for the return of refugees to their homes, to their villages. And so Israel has been firing at them because they're sitting ducks. The wall around, these people are there. The Israeli army snipers are on these in these towers. And these people, men and women and children, are coming and protesting against the, the fact that they have been denied the right to, to, to freedom, they deny the, the right to go back to their home. And they're only asking for the implementation of UN resolution on this. Israel doesn't want to do this, so it's killing them. And I tell you, it is heartbreaking. These are innocent people who only ask 
asking to return to their home. It is their right. It's an international right for refugees to return to their homes, to their villages. This is what's happening, you know, and that's that's sick, you know, and and so many people believe the Israelis. Don't believe them. I know. Believe me, I'm not just trying to say this. I know the Israeli mentality. I've lived with them since 1948. And it's very they're very deceptive. Very deceptive and manipulated. And I think it's time for us to take a stand. Hamas has nothing to do with these demonstrations. These demonstrations are the people of Gaza who who want liberation. And I think we need to stand with them. Thank you. Ahmed. Israel is very kind to the Christians, you know, because um, it's only against that Israel is only against the Muslims. My friends, the problem started not as a religious war. The problem was that Israel wanted the whole of Palestine. They wanted Palestine. They wanted the land of Palestine. When we were driven out from Bisan, they did not ask us. Are you a Christian? You can stay. Are you a Muslim? You can leave. We were all Palestinian, Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims. And before 1948, please remember, there were also Palestinian Jews. We always, the three, the three peoples. Well, it's one people actually, but three religions. We're always living together. So we always had Palestinian Jews who spoke Arabic just like I do, and Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims. So the conflict was not about religion. And Israel tries to, to, to make you think that, oh, you know, it is Christians are fine, it's the Muslims are. It, the problem is that we are Palestinians for Israel. And they want us, they want all the Palestinians out. You know, and I think this is very important to to remember. When I go through that checkpoint in the in the uh, in the airport, they don't ask me whether I was a Christian. I am a Palestinian. I hold an Israeli passport because I lost my Palestinian uh, ID when Israel was was formed. You know, so we only had. It was we were only given an Israeli ID, and and so the Israeli passport. I go, I travel everywhere in the world. The Israeli passport is respected everywhere in the world. I travel with no visas because Israel has all these connections with the different countries. It is least respected. My Israeli passport. The only place it is not respected is in Israel itself. So I'm discriminated against as a Palestinian because I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Jew. Uh, but everywhere I go, people don't know whether I'm a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim. So they respect me, you know, because I come from Israel. But it is very interesting. You see the discrimination, the racism in Israel. It's very, very clear against Palestinian Muslims and Christians. All the time. 
our time, uh, would you want to say a few words just to wrap up? And then uh, we'll have a couple announcements, and I'm going to have uh, Reverend Naeem then wrap it up for us uh, uh, at the end. Yeah, when Desmond Tutu was visiting Gaza, he was asked about Hamas. He, they said, Do you, would you ever talk to Hamas? He said, are you kidding me? They are the first people that you want to talk to. Why? Because he knows, as communities of color, they have legitimate concerns for their own freedom that were not heard or not being heard. And as such, in every community that has struggled for against its own impression, some factions, usually it's very small factions, will use violent tactics. But the large majority will use nonviolent tactics. But that does not vitiate the legitimacy of their concerns that stand behind their tactics. And as such, it is important to, to, to be clear about this and then to flip the tables. Remember that man that flipped the tables back 2,000 years ago? On the same arguments and say, we as Palestinians never threw the Jews to the sea. We were thrown by Zionist Jewish peoples to the sea when Israel was established. People escaped in boats and what became known to us as the Trail of Tears. So it, let's not continue to allow the oppressor to write history. We were thrown to the sea as Palestinians. We continue to be transferred on buses. Ten years ago when I was working in Palestine, Israel got Palestinians out of their caves. They live in the South Hebron Hills on, in, in, inside caves. They demolished their caves, put them on buses, and threw them at the next available village that would take them. They transfer us to this day on buses. So that system is important to clarify and not to fall again into the same language, an oppressive cycle of the oppression. It is really important to do that. And that's part of undoing racism and undoing our own oppressions. In our, there's, a, there's a movie I'll just lastly say, and I mentioned it a couple of times when I was speaking here, Real Bad Arabs, R-E-E-L, as in the movies, the, the projector Real Bad Arab. It will show you from the, the, the 80 year history of our movies, of how Arabs are painted in the media, to where we can come to these questions that are not relevant to the Palestinian cause because of our own brainwashing from our own media and our own journalism in the past 80 years. I would, I would suggest you watch that for these questions to be answered from our own undoing oppression, uh, oppression and racism lenses. I'm just thankful at the same time for all of you for coming out here. I mean, it is a lot of support. And I always say that when I worked, first worked in Palestine um, as a lawyer when I was 24, the thing that I came back after a year working there, and I came back depressed, I was taking medications, I was lying in bed trying to overcome a depression. The thing that got me out of bed on the, as thereafter are exactly groups like yourselves who wanted and welcomed the message from the Palestinian perspective. So thank you, and I continue to be thankful to these spaces, and I pray for the opening up or larger spaces so we can have justice and we can have a potential for a beloved community because the dream still continues in this space today. Thank you. I'm going to ask Reverend Naeem to close. Uh, or well, I have a question for you, Naeem, but first of all, I want to remind you uh, nine books are for sale uh, over with Joan on the table. There are posters for Arab Fest. Please pick one up and spread them far and wide around the whole community. Arab Fest 2018 is bigger and better this year than ever. The committee that's been working on it has been doing a fantastic job. And so that's June 2nd and 3rd. You want to pick up a poster and send it around the community. And finally, uh, Ali Paris, Friday night, June the 1st. Uh, pick up your tickets from Joan. I put it, let me get to my church here in Plymouth. We need to be here in Plymouth. That's right, Tony. It'll be right here at Plymouth Church in the sanctuary. Wonderful music, an international recording star, and the $15 goes to the various ministries in, in uh, Bethlehem and Annapolis uh, to help out the, the children of Palestine. Naeem, uh, this is your, uh, I want to ask you one last question, and this will give you an opportunity to close for us. Uh, your uh, highly acclaimed first book, Justice No Justice, John Gardner's got it on his shelf, he read it, and many of us have read it here. 
we referred to it earlier. Um, the Bible of Palestine liberation theology. You often say that the final word doesn't belong to anybody else, to, uh, uh, not the president, not people of power. You say the final word is justice. What do you mean by that? I believe, my friends, that the final word always belongs to God, not to the people of power. And we believe that the God we believe in is a God of justice, God of love, God of mercy, and the God of all, for all people. And I believe that Christ continues to call us into peacemaking. We all remember the words of Christ when he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Peace can be made. Peacemakers. We need to make peace. We cannot make peace unless we are involved, unless we are connected, unless we are active. And so I want to say to you, first of all, I want to thank this man, Mike, for organizing this. I want to thank this church for hosting us and the pastor and the wonderful welcome that we've had. I want to thank all of you for being here. But please remember that we are servants of God when we are about speak peacemaking and peacemaking begins here in your community you can educate the people around you. if you have not been to visit come and visit us you need to see for yourself what's really happening there and then you need to champion the issue of justice for all the people of the land we are not against the existence of the state of israel we want israel to live in peace but Israel has to do justice. And without justice, Israel will never have security and will never have peace because this is the nature of things. Israel needs to do justice in accordance with international law. I don't define justice. Justice is already defined by the United Nations, by international law. That's all that we want. We want Israel to live in peace, but it has to do it in accordance with international law. Please join us, work with us, support us, support the ministry which these people are working on. Support Sabil back home also and come and see us and pray for us. We are people of prayer and we need to pray for peace with justice. So thank you for being here and may God bless you all. Naim will uh, be happy to sign books as you uh, purchase them. If you'd like to make a contribution to FASNA, Friends of Seville, North America, there's the ability to do that over there. Buy your tickets for Ali Paris concert. Eat some of the food that's left. And God speed you on your way home tonight. Thanks for being here tonight, everybody. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>